All right, awesome. So awesome. So it even told us. Great. Um, so welcome everybody to our Our Ladies Philly November event. Um, I want to say especially a big welcome to anybody who's this is their first Our Ladies Philly meetup or maybe their first Our Ladies event ever. Uh, so especially welcome to you. And with that, I want to introduce. Oh, yep. Okay, I think this is right. Okay, what are we doing today? Today our uh, meetup is going to be about getting started with unit testing in R. And as an agenda, here you go. We're going to have this short welcome and a few announcements from me, but then I'm going to pass the mic over to Shannon and Gordon to take you through the workshop. We'll take a short break um, and then we'll be right back. Uh, one thing you'll notice on these slides is that there is a little URL there, tiny URL, our ladies dash November or dash NOV. If you go there, that's going to take you to a Google document, which has a couple purposes. One is it has links to some content for today's event. It also is a place where you can ask us questions. So if you have questions during the meetup, feel free to put them in the chat or put them in that document. And then we'll stop periodically for questions and try to voice them that way. Also, if you want to tweet about the event, we always appreciate that. A little social media engagement is great. So you can use hashtag our ladies for those types of things and tweet at us at our ladies Philly. Uh, also, for those of you who might be new to our organization, our ladies is a worldwide organization. There are chapters like our chapter all over the United States as well as all over the world. And one of our main goals is to promote gender diversity in the art community. And we wanna do it in a safe and friendly environment. So one of the things you can do is you can check out the Our Ladies Code of Conduct. When you joined the meeting today, you should probably have been asked to look that over. And if you ever wanna reference it, it's there available on the ourladies.org website. And there are a few ways that you can get involved beyond attending today, which is awesome. One is that we have a Slack workspace for Our Ladies Philly, and you can join with the link on the screen. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel. So this event will be posted there and we have all our recent events that have been online. And we are always looking for uh, people who want to either serve as a mentor or a speaker presenter for one of our workshops like we're doing today. So if you wanna do that, you can always email us at our ladies or at philly at ourladies.org. You can reach out to us over Slack or you can sign up on this form here. And we are actively planning for 2022 already. So if you have ideas and you want to chat, I think we've already started some conversations on our Slack about potential topics for 2022. So that segues nicely into some announcements. Um, you can always check out our upcoming events on our meetup page. December 8th was just announced today where there's going to be a great set of talks about using packages at your work, building and maintaining packages, which is a perfect topic because it segues really nicely from this month's event into next month's event. Uh, in January, we're going to have more of a networking event around our New Year's resolutions. All right, and with that, I will want to turn it over to Shannon and Gordon as a brief introduction. Uh, Shannon is a prior presenter at Our Ladies, and she's also a data scientist um, at Memorial Sloan Kettering in the Prostate Cancer uh, Clinical Trials Consortium. And Gordon is a lead data scientist at SoCure. And with that, I want to go ahead and hand it over to you, Shannon. I'll stop presenting, and you can take it away. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. And um, before we get started, let's go ahead and write in the chat what your native language is. I've got English, Vietnamese, Spanish, Chinese, Mandarin, Arabic, Portuguese, Bosnian, English, and I can barely speak that. <laughs> So we have a lot of variety in your native language here. So if at any point I am speaking too quickly or you need me to repeat something, please do not hesitate to ask. Um, I want to make sure the content is accessible to you. Also, if you can hear my kids in the background screaming or being distracting, let me know. Um, I can't tell what is coming through the door um, and I can tell them to move to a different room and be quieter. Uh, I would also like to thank Gordon for helping me prepare content for this workshop. If you aren't aware of how 
Um, I came to know Gordon. I actually came to know Gordon on Twitter. I was curating for We Are Our Ladies on Twitter, and I mentioned something about a workshop that I wish existed, which was this workshop on unit testing. Um, and he very graciously offered to volunteer his expertise in mentorship to make this workshop happen. So thank you so much, Gordon. We really appreciate you. Yeah. Gordon, do you want to say anything before we get started? Uh, no, just great to be here. Uh, glad that it's happening and uh, happy to hear, hear the presentation. Yeah. Um, I think maybe before we even dive into our code and just so you know, this is going to be like live our coding. It's not going to be perfect or seamless or flawless. So just bear with me if we have anything unexpected happen, because that's like what happens when you're building packages and, and doing dev work. Um, and let's talk about like what is unit testing and, and why are we doing it? So maybe in the chat, why don't you write down um, if you have no experience with unit testing, some experience with unit testing, or if you consider yourself very experienced with unit testing. All right, so I'm seeing limited to none and a little bit of very experienced, great. Um, Okay. All right, so I think most people are falling into this boat of no experience and or a little or some, and we have a few more experienced um, <laughs> unit testers. So before we even kind of talked about this topic um, for Our Ladies Philly, like, um, Gordon and I like had some really interesting conversations about like what is unit testing and, and why should we be doing it and I, and I don't know if you remember exactly what you told me Gordon um, a while back but you had a really interesting take on it especially as it relates to being like a woman programmer. Oh yes yeah. so um, so one of the things that I've noticed about um, testing and like working with um, other developers a lot of the times is that um, like tests are um, like there's something that sounds incredibly scary and like it's something that real real, pro like real programmers do and regular people don't do. Um, but oftentimes it's actually kind of the opposite of when you're like, when you get familiar with testing your own code, it's a really easy and useful way of like grounding yourself in other people criticizing your work because uh, you can kind of look at their code and sort of see its test coverage. Um, and that's something that like across different languages, across different like types of programming, it's a really, it's a standard thing that you can usually look at. So it's kind of a, a skill I think that if you get good at it and you start testing your code, it's a way of sort of like being able to prove that your code does what it says it can do. And it's a way of like in, um, kind of, uh, of um, pushing back a little bit on some other people who maybe are telling you that you're not good enough at this job because <laughs> it's like kind of like one of these like objective way to defend your work like my tests yeah. are passing it's working like yeah and that's and it's kind of like it's 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 what it means I think for tests like tests to be or for your code to be correct is that it, it passes tests so oftentimes especially in data science world you'll find people who are quite sort of arrogant about their work but they don't have test coverage and their test their code is often just like it's just incorrect um because if you don't test it like it doesn't matter how smart you are it's very very difficult to to have things that are right if you don't write tests for them all right well thank you very much for that so what we're going to do i'm going to pop a link in the chat this is the github repo that we are going to use to get started with I am going to share my screen. And what we are actually going to be doing is we are going to be picking up with where we left off with our little Ralph package a year ago. So Ralph stands for Our Ladies of Philadelphia. And last year I ran a workshop on your first package in one hour and we created Ralph. And so what we are going to do today is we're going to pick up a copy of Ralph. Um, I'm, I'm leaving Ralph untouched because I want that to be a standalone resource, but we're going to do work with Ralph gets tested. So I'm going to go ahead and enter, use this create from GitHub. 
and we're going to do, and all of you can do this at home too, if you have all of these packages downloaded um, and you have GitHub installed and all of that. If you don't have these packages downloaded and you don't have GitHub working and authenticated on your computer or whatever you need, um, you can also just go to that repo and um, I'll show you real quick. You can go to this repo um, and click on this code button. Uh, and download a zipped file of this if you don't want to do this through GitHub and then you can work locally if you want to type along with me. If you don't want to type along with me, thank you. <laughs> I think I put that in a direct message instead of everyone. Thank you so much for sending that to everyone. Um, if you don't want to um, type along with me, you are also welcome to just sit back and watch and do everything. Um, after this event, um, I will be converting all of this material into a blog post and this will be recorded. So if you just wanna watch, that's fine too. And if you wanna code along, you are also going to be coding. You can do that. And no, we will not be setting up anything in our studio cloud today. Um, as far as package development in our studio cloud, I haven't really tried that. Um, I feel like there might be some things that might get a little tricky or not tricky, I don't know. Um, so no, I haven't set up an RCU cloud for this event. All right, so we are going to use this create from GitHub, Shannon Pelleggi, Ralph gets tested. Um, this is going to open up a project with exactly how we left off Ralph a year ago. And you can see that there are already some files in our project. So we have our description file, what this package does and the imports that it depends on. Um, we haven't like done too much to this description file. Like I didn't even like fill in the authors for this package, but that's okay, it does have a license. We have a namespace file. We also have an R file, uh, which has the one function that we added to this package. The one function that we added to this package was compute core. And what compute core does is basically like a wrapper to compute a tidy correlation. So we can look at the help file. We can load all dev tools, load all. Now we can look at the help file for compute core. And it tells us. We're going to compute a tidy correlation. We can grab the example from this help file here. Uh, let's see here. It's got var1 equals eruptions, and var2 equals waiting. And so it computes the correlation between eruptions and waiting from that whole faithful data set. All right. So we have one function in our package. Now, what are we going to do to automate tests for this one function? So maybe one thing that we can do to get started is just um, let's look at the test that documentation. And maybe all of you can take a look on it at home as well. So there are, if you look at the test that documentation, test that is a package that helps you facilitate this automated testing. Uh, you can look at this reference page to look at all of the functions in test that and take a look at it for a few minutes and think about like what might be some things we could possibly test about this function to confirm that we are getting what we expect when we run it. And if you don't have any ideas, that's fine. I have some to go through. Hmm. 
Okay, I see one comment that we can correlate uh, a very well to itself. I think you're maybe perhaps thinking about guarding against misspecification. Like if someone says like, I want to do correlation of like eruptions versus eruptions, like maybe tell the user that's probably a silly idea or something. Um, possibly is maybe what you meant for that comment. And if you didn't mean that, uh, you can uh, clarify. Um, Carla also said we could test that the input data is numeric. That's a good catch too. We want to make sure that input data is numeric. Um, otherwise, we might get some errors um, when, when we try to run this function. And, and those errors could also be tricky to decipher. Yeah, test that the output actually comes in the form that we want it to come. So this output is actually outputting as a tibble here and that we can make sure it's of the correct dimension. Okay, we can also check for missing data. That's a great idea uh, and, and warn the user um, if there is any missing data, because right now it's a little black boxy. We don't really know what the number of observations that went into this analysis were. Um, whether the column name is in the data frame, yes, that is something that I have actually made this mistake working on this function, trying to figure out what I did wrong as because I was putting in the wrong column name. So that's a great test to run as well, right? So I think um, there's testing, you have a lot of great testing ideas here that can either be done on the function input side, right? Like is the user actually inputting good information that we want to take into the function and on the output side as well. So we are going to be talking about both of those things. I'm going to go back over to the, just the kind of general file structure. And the first thing that we are going to want to do when we set up a test is we're going to do one function that we're going to run one time, which is going to establish the overall testing structure for this package. So we're going to do use this colon colon use test that. So this is a function we run runtime to kind of just prep some things and set it up. Uh, if you'll watch on the right hand side, we should see a few more things pop up. All right. And it tells us what we did. So it added test that to our suggest field in our description file. So we go back over to our suggests and it says we have test that there now. And it's also um, setting an addition field in our description file to three, which I think is a little bit more of an advanced topic. Um, we can, we went, it created a new folder down here called tests. Um, and there is a subfolder called test that that is empty. Um, and it also created this other folder, uh, this other file called test that.r. And it tells us what we're going to do next, right? So it says next call use this use test to initialize a basic test file and open it for editing. Um, does anyone know, I actually just found out about this yesterday when I was talking about uh, this workshop with someone else. Does anyone have any clue what this edition three is on test that? No idea. Requirement, snapshots, version of the package. It is kind of weirdly related to package version, but not the same thing, Gordon, you want to chime in here? Do you know it? I think it is the minimum package version. So, um, so if, if you install like test that, it'll basically check, like if you have test that two installed and you installed this package, it would install the uh, test that 3.0 if you installed okay. suggests. Um, there was a pretty big change between test that two and three, and that's why they kind of have that often there. So, like, because all the expectations are different in test that three. Yeah. And there's also, if you, look at it, there's also a, a little help file about the third edition. Um, um, I was talking to someone yesterday about how they updated their test that infrastructure to the third edition, and it made all of their checks go down from like 40 minutes to 14 minutes. Uh, so it was running a lot faster for their package. So just if you're getting started now, then you're getting started in a good fast place. And if maybe you already had some existing test infrastructure, maybe consider moving it up to the third edition uh, for efficiencies and speed. All right. Are there any questions about anything before we start writing our first test?
There was a question on um, when do you write tests? Like, do you write it every time? Is it basically like every time I write a function or do I like wait until I have my whole package? Like, when do you write a test? Actually, I thought I forgot to um, clarify in our introductions our experience with testing. So let me just clarify um, that I do not have a package on CRAN. My experience with package development is for internal work packages only. And to this point, I have not actually yet put any tests in my internal packages, but you can better be sure after this workshop and preparing it and leading up to it, I'm certainly ready to get started with it because I've experienced a lot of um, painful and tedious processes. Like we do testing on our functions to make sure that our functions are working correctly, but I often do those testing ad hoc and also not in an automated fashion, right? So after learning this better myself, I can see where I will improve inefficiencies in my own development. And I'll let Gordon go ahead and speak up from there. Um, so yes, yeah, so this is a really good question. And um, it really depends on how you're writing functions. So like sometimes you're writing a function and it's, um, it's a process of discovery as you're writing it. Um, and in that case, you can't really write a test because you don't really know what the function should do. Like you might, you know, not know it should it output a tibble or a vector or something like that. Um, so for those ones, I think it's good to write those tests uh, after the function is kind of in a stable state, um, or maybe you have like a group of functions that all kind of work together, um, and then you might write the tests for all of them together. Um, there's also these cases where it really is useful to actually write tests before writing the function. Um, and those are something like if you have like a logical function where it's like, uh, you know precisely how you want this function to behave, um, you can write tests um, before you actually write the function to just spell out like what do I want this function to do um, and then fill in the function and get the test to pass as you as you write it. Um, so that latter approach is called test driven development in some circles. Um, I don't personally write functions that way very often, um, but sometimes it is a real handy thing. Like if you're doing something like maybe you, somebody is giving you like a numerical method to implement in R and they've given you like a bunch of cases to do it, you might just include all those in, in tests to to sort of help figure, help get any of that stuff out of your mind before you start working on it. Are there any other questions we can take? There's, there's a related question, um, which was right after that, which is when I start writing tests, I get sucked into a rabbit hole of tests. How can I have a better process or strategy for writing tests? Which is a little bit similar question. Yeah, so I think it's, um, it's, it's, there's not a right answer to any of this. And I think fundamentally like tests are for you as the developer. Um, so I, I like to think about it like this idea of just like, um, there's things in my code that I care or, re or really care are right. And there's other things that I don't care about that much of they're right. And I think you wanna try to have um, so really solid tests for all the things that you care about as a developer. So there might be some errors you don't wanna, you don't care about testing. There might be even whole functions that are not important um, so you don't need to test um, but I, I think in general like tr most of the time um, most of the time it's good to write more tests I think most people tend to tend to under test their code um, but in terms of a strategy I think just like get a couple down and then as you discover bugs like try to make sure that there's a test for every bug that you fix um, that kind of stuff and and eventually like laziness will help curb the desire to over test, I think. Uh, so it's not, there's not like a right answer to either of these questions, although they're excellent questions to keep asking yourself. It's just kind of whatever works and what you what you care about. And there's a certain point at which too many tests, like they stop being useful because they're too hard to maintain the test suite relative to how much value they're giving you. Um, but most projects are, are not at that point. Yeah, and I think David wrote in the chat a good point. Is it fair to say that you should consider problems that trip you up during building the function as a good test candidates? Yeah, for sure. Especially like any problems you have today when you're writing a test or problems you have in the future, things you're not clear about. Um, just because that's an example of just, you, if you made the mistake as you're writing a function, you're definitely going to make a mistake in six months. So a test will keep you honest on those problems. Okay, I think that's it for questions for now. Yeah, that was a good little pause because it reminded me one thing I wanted to do before I started testing thing. I wanted to just kind of run that dev tools check. Uh, you know, it takes a couple of seconds to run, um, but just to show you all that right now, the status of our package is pretty clean. It's error-free, note-free, and warning-free. 
as it should be, which is exactly where we left it. Uh, <laughs> wait a minute. Um, I did add the test. And uh, it's actually giving me an error. So I meant to do this before I added the test at first. Here we go. So I think it's getting angry at me because like the files over there are like empty. So uh, and I think I'm also let's let's see if we're clearing that up when we uh, add a test in. All right. So to do this, to add our first file, our first test. So we've already run use this, use test that, and we're gonna do that one time. And now we're gonna run use this, use test. Um, and we're gonna give this file a name. Typically you can name this the same as the function that you are going to be testing. So the name of the function that I am testing is compute core. So I'm going to create that file. Um, and it opens up with a default file. So here you can see test Compute core is um, under tests and test that. Uh, it gives you a, a little starter example that uh, you can use or not. I'll just go ahead and write over this. So the first thing I'm going to do is rename the description here that's in this test file. We can really call this description whatever we want to. It's going to show up in your logs when you're testing to kind of give you a hint as to where your test might have failed. So I don't exactly have a great name for this, but I will call it like assess compute core or something. Um, and we can call it whatever we want to there. I'm going to get rid of that first thing there. And the first thing I'm going to define is what we expect to get out. Uh, when we run our example function from the documentation. So I'm going to save this as an object called expected. I'm going to say that this should be the result of compute core when we are running the faithful data set with bar one equal to eruptions, bar two equal to waiting time. Move this over so you can see that full thing. Um, because I do have DevTools load all already executed, I should be able to run expected. And you can see that it is there. Um, result. So in my environment now. So now we are going to assess what's in the expected. I saw one comment earlier that we can see um, if we are actually getting the results out that we expected. So like, is the object coming out that we expected? So let's test the object first. Um, this tibble that we are getting out is essentially a data frame. So we can write our first test to make sure we are getting the correct type of object out. So we are going to expect a three class expected, and we should be getting a data frame back out. I just hit control S to save this document. And now we can execute this test a few different ways. So we can execute it over here with a run test button. And we can also execute it by doing um, DevTools test. Both of those ways run a little bit differently. I'm gonna first start with the run test button over here, which is actually, if I recall correctly, Gordon, you can um, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, the, what the run test does is it runs uh, this test in a fresh environment. Is that correct, Gordon? All right, which is slightly different than running it with DevTools tests, which is actually going to run it in your global environment. So you can imagine whatever you already have in your global environment could possibly interact with that test result, uh, which would not be ideal. So run test runs it in a fresh environment. And you can see here that we tested compute core. Uh, we have zero failing, zero warning, zero skipping in one pass. We're done. We did pass this test, so um, we did actually get a data frame out for the class of the expected object. Let's see what happens when I run DevTools check with that warning and see if that warning went away.
Now, when you run DevTools check, it is actually going to automatically run those test files that you have as well. So you should be seeing those results in there. This is spinning quite a while on this little guy. I don't do not know what's happening there. I feel like that is unusual. All right. Um, so yeah, it was just angry before because I had like set up that testing infrastructure and I had like no tests essentially. Um, but now we have zero errors, zero warnings, and zero notes. And I believe it also executed those tests and that those tests um, failures would have come back had um, anything failed. But since nothing failed, nothing's showing up in the log. Is that right, Gordon? Yeah, so it would, fit, it would show up as an error if your okay. uh, test set, if any of your test set things uh, failed. Yeah. You got a not that useful an output of which test failed. That's one of the one of the words of the command checks is that it doesn't really tell you precisely what went wrong <laughs> with the test. All right, so we've got one test up. Feeling good? Any questions before we move on to another test? I don't see any questions in the chat or in the document, so I think we're good to go. All right. Um, because I saved that object in the environment there, I'm just going to do a control shift F10 to restart R, clear out my environment, um, and we'll experiment with the DevTools uh, test next instead of run tests. Uh, I will add one more test. So let's add expect equal, and we're going to check to see that the dimension of our object returned is as expected. So the dimension of our expected object should come out as one row and two columns. And now uh, just to, for the sake of showing it, I'm gonna write dev tools. It will, if I can spell it correctly, there we go. All right, um, so it showed up a little bit differently than when you use the run test button, right? The run test button showed up over here in the top right pane. Now it's showing over here in my bottom, in my console, um, but it did say that it is passing now. Um, I do see a question in the chat. Can we write separate for errors, separate test that statements with more descriptive errors? I think maybe you're talking about this description right here. Um, I would defer to Gordon on like when you might want to do this in one chunk versus breaking this up. Yeah, you can also write uh, there's like expect error and expect warning. So if you want to test whether your function is emitting the right errors, um, that also uh, is possible. Um, yeah, the, 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 the little test that thing, like that's more to do with, it's like similar to like having a paragraph break, like that's how I describe it. So you kind of keep related expectations together uh, and then you have another test that chunks, but it, there's no right answer for that. You can have lots of them or fewer of them. It doesn't really matter. It's more just like organizational, how you're thinking about, about writing it. And I don't know if you remember what uh, came out of this function, but I'll just remind you what came out of this function. So we'll just go ahead and execute this real quick. Um, so the next test I'm going to write, you can see we have this uh, table that gets returned with a correlation and key value. So the next test I'm going to write is to confirm that I'm getting those named objects back. So let's do expect named. And we are going to put in expected here. And the named objects should be correlation or the named columns in PVAL. 
And I'm going to do control S to save that file. And Gordon, do you have a preference? Do you normally do the run test button or do you normally do dev tools test? Um, I usually do command shift T, which kind of runs the, the test, the whole, all the tests in, in the thing. So but it's basically the same thing as the uh, run test. So that's kind of my, the muscle memory I do a lot when package developing is command shift L to load things as I'm yeah. kind of messing around. And then when I'm writing tests off, I just do command shift T and just, and then you can keep working as they run. Um, and then if they fail, you can say, oh, what are you wrong? Yeah. Um, but yeah, running running tests more often is a good habit to get into. And just like, that's a good little shortcut for that. Cause, uh, cause you often think that they're definitely gonna pass, but then they don't cause of something that you did wrong. And if you just kind of in that thing, if it's like more often you do that than the, you haven't gone as far before hitting the failure. <laughs> yeah. So is, is command shift T the equivalent to the run test button? Uh, the, so command, it's, it's equivalent in this case. So run test like runs the tests on this current test file. Um, yeah. So it would only run test compute core. Um, the uh, uh, command shift T runs all the test files that you have. Since you have only have one in this, in this package, it's the same. Um, so the okay. reason why you would do the run tests is that you might have lots of tests that might take a long time to run, and then you yeah. don't really care about them. So you want to just run the, the ones you're working on. Awesome. Um, I have a couple more tests to add. Actually, one more test to add before we get to that test to add. Um, let's see how our tests are doing. Um, so one thing that we can assess is the percent of the code that's covered. We can do that with cover package, C-O-V-R, colon, colon, and I'm going to run the report. I do believe I might get an error. Yes. Um, so it gets angry at me if the package is already loaded in my environment. I did just run DevTools load all. So I'm going to do command shift F10 to restart R, and then that'll make this report run. All right. So now we have a little report over here uh, about Compute Core. Uh, we can look at the source code and uh, nope, we can look over here uh, and it's going to open up, how is the percent calculated? It's going to open up the percent of your lines in your code that are covered under your tests. Gordon, how is that percent calculated? How does it know what's green and that 100% are covered? Yeah, so basically it's not, it's not doing anything particularly intelligent. It just says like, what of these lines of code have been run when you executed your test? So it's not really evaluating is the test, is it well tested or not? Like, is the test good or bad? It just says like, how, how does this test, has this line of code ever been run by your test suite? And that's what that like one X on the left there means. So if it was run multiple times, it just basically like counts how many times the, the, that line of code has been um, uh, executed when you ran your test suite. Um, awesome. That is our coverage. Are there any other questions before we add another test to Ralph? There are a couple other questions which are I think more maybe theoretical on like testing still, like why should we test if that's okay? Sure. Okay, so one of them is coming back to when we were talking earlier, we said, when you fix a bug, that's a good time to write a test. Do you have an example of doing this? Uh, yeah, I do. Um, so I, I this happens to me at work a lot uh, because I, I've maintained like our packages for other people and they often find that I've made mistakes in writing that package. Um, and so it might be something like um, there's some, you know, some something I just didn't think about when I was writing the function and that they, they threw at it. Uh, like a, a common one is like somebody called the function in a reasonable way and got a really, really unfriendly error message out of it. Um, and so the way that I'll resolve that is I'll often like write a better error message for the function. Um, and then I'll include that as a test uh, to make sure that when the, when the person called the function in the way that they called it, um, that they're getting that error message out of it. Um, and that's really important because like the, the feedback from like users about how they're actually using the thing um, is very difficult to include into the development cycle. And so having all those tests there, whenever like somebody else experiences some problem or you experience some problem, um, it's a good way of just kind of, it's like obviously like you missed that when you were developing the function. So it's a good thing to include as a, as a test. Um, does that answer the question there? 
Yeah, I think that's a great answer. Um, one other question is, how is running tests different than trying out different data types and sets on your functions and debugging? Is it a more Not streamlined at all. way to do this? Yeah. yeah. So it, the only difference is that it's, is that, so this is one of the things that I, I've really learned as I've gotten um, better at programming and been around people who are, who are really talented at programming is that they don't have um, these amazing giant brains that encapsulate, that they can hold all these different variables in. The way that they're able to write these really good pieces of software is that they've kind of exported those normal checks that everybody does when they're writing functions into a kind of formal set of expectations that you can get a computer to run. Um, so for example, like, you know, several of the packages that I, like one of the packages I work on at work, it has, I think, 14, 1500 tests in it. Um, so it's really not possible for me to work on that um, package without, like, but with keeping any of that in my mind, um, I have to rely on the expectations to be the, the way of checking it. So it's just a way of formalizing the normal thing that, that you all do when you write functions, like as you, you sort of interact interactively do that. And you might do that like all the time that you write a function, but you have to, to for that to work, you kind of have to, um, have this memory of all the different cases that you could throw at that function. And at some point it just gets too big to do. Um, so that's all that te testing is really is just getting all that stuff out of your brain um, onto so that the computer can execute it. Okay, I think that's, uh, thank you for that. I think that's it for the questions for now. Um, feel free people to keep adding your questions in the chat. Definitely. All right. We've got a couple more tests to throw at this. So let's do expect equals. So you can see here that when we execute our compute core function, we expect to see a correlation of 0 0.901. Uh, let's see if this actually is going to return out. So we've got expect equal test. The value that I'm testing is the correlation estimate. So I want to see if that is equal to 0 0.901. I want to do control S to save this file. Um, I do not have a comma there. All right, so now control S to save this file, command shift T to test it. And let's see what happens here. Oh, I got it. I got a fail. Um, and let's take a look and see what this fail is, because it took me a little bit to kind of realize what was happening. All right, expected, it's not, expected correlation not equal to 0 0.901. The names of actual is a character vector core. The names of expected is absent. Does anyone have any clue what is happening here? All right, is it the incorrect format input? Is it a data frame versus non-data frame? Is it a precision issue? Right, because I hear I see 0 0.901 here and 0 0.9008 here. Something to do with vectors, right? Like this is like missing data. Did we not tell it what we were expecting? Like, well, well, what is this thing so angry about? All right, um, I'm going to run this expected line real quick here um, in my console. I might need to do dev tools load all. Let's see here. Yeah, so let's do dev tools load all. And maybe we'll get a, a sneak peek here. I'm going to run that line in the console. I'm going to run a structure on it. Does anyone kind of see what's going on in this object now? It's not the rounding issue is an issue, but it is not the very first issue that it is angry about. So you can see that our table does have two columns. It's got a correlation column and a p-value column, but there is an attribute 
associated with the correlation column. And you can see that the attribute is that that correlation column actually is a named vector with the name core. <laughs> Um, I think I said that correctly. If any, if I said that incorrectly, you're welcome to correct me. Um, so there is an attribute hidden there um, that was not actually captured in, um, yeah, wasn't actually captured here. So how are we going to fix this and make it pass? And what are some steps that we might go through? Um, this was like one approach I took to debugging, right? I looked at that object and I looked at the structure of the object and um, it's probably good, worthwhile to talk about. There's actually another approach to debugging that I could have taken here. I'm going to do, um, command shift F10 to restart my R session, um, and do a fresh environment. And if you haven't used it yet, um, one approach you can take here uh instead of running it in this environment you you can put in a browser right here and if you would do this at all differently gordon please tell me because it's been a while since we've talked about it right so i'm going into the source of my function um and i'm putting in the browser command what that browser command is going to allow us to do is going to allow us to interactively step into this function uh when we execute it and kind of run this function line by line to see what is happening. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to do control S to save that function. Then I'm going to do dev tools load all, which is could have been uh, the command shift L as well. So uh, dev tools load all. Now I'm going to pull up that command. Uh, let's see here. I'm going to execute compute core. And now I have entered browser mode. So I'm at the start of my function, which means I can go through and I can execute this line by line to see what is happening. So um, it may or may not be beneficial to save this as an object as you're executing it. I'm going to go ahead and, and run this. Um, you can see the very first thing that's going to happen when I run my core.test is I'm going to get that really messy base R output. Um, I can go ahead and run the next line here. I'm still used to a browser. So if I do anything funny, now I run it with the broom tidy. Um, so I see the tidy version of that. Um, and let's see here. Now I can also run it with my select and rename. Um, and if there's definitely any way you would be doing this differently, just let me know. So select and rename, and now I can see this. Um, and I'm still not really seeing, you know, that that name that was like bugging the test. If we want, um, maybe what we can do that might make it easier to see this is to save this object as results, run results. And then we can see results over here uh, in our environment, take a look at it. Again, we're not seeing that weird core name. Uh, but I think in our browser, we can go ahead and type in, we want to see the structure of results and the, the result wasn't there, uh, results. And we can still see that there is that named attribute there. Um, I, I think this is like a, the browser function is really, really powerful to let you step into it because especially if your function is using tidy eval and non-standard evaluation, I mean, it can be really hard to like get up and running and debug your function. So this is a really nice, uh, quick way to get into it. All right, so I already spent a little bit of time grappling with this error um, uh, before this workshop. So I can tell you that this line of code here will actually resolve it. So let's see here. Oh, it's getting angry at me now. It's not letting me edit this. Gordon, should I be able to edit uh, this? You just have to stop. Yeah, so I would recommend ah. like stopping because it's, uh, yeah, it just gets a little, sometimes it's, yeah, it's, if you're kind of changed the source too much, it puts you in that other viewer mode. All right. So, yeah. All right, so we just stopped it. Um, I'm going to write uh, attribute results dollar sign correlation. 
uh, we're going to get that names and we're going to set it to null. And then we are going to ask our function to return uh, results. I'm going to go ahead and take the browser. Oh, oh, oh let's run it one more time with the browser. So um, let's see here. Uh, so now we can, oh, let's pull up the old version of it. Yeah, because it's uh, you need to reload all. That's one of the one of the tricky things because it, it browsers Good. into whatever the um, the loaded function is. Okay. So you need to do uh, sort of stop so and load all. This happens to be like restart R, dev tools load all, all that good stuff. All right, and now we are going to run that function again, step into our browser. Now we are in the new version of our function that we've been working on. So we can go ahead and pull up results here. If we look at the structure of results, you're gonna see that it's gonna have those like, maybe. All right, I get a warning message. I'm not gonna worry about it. Um, but you can still see it's got that named object here. Now we're going to run this line about um, making those uh, attributes null and pull up that structure again. And you can see it's gone away. So hopefully when we run this expectation, we will have cleared up that one item that was bogging us. Browser is definitely, you know, something that takes some practice to get used to. Um, definitely something I want to force myself to do more, but oh my goodness, if you have tidy eval, it's going to help you get up and running and step into that function so much quicker than all the other old uh, hot ways I used to do it. Anything else you want to say about it, uh, Gordon? I'm just saying, so this is, I think, a really good example of a common thing that happens when you're writing code, which is that you, so like what happened here, I think, is that the correlation, like the correlation value is like a named vector. So it's not just a regular vector because it's like a little, does a little odd behavior, like core test produces a odd thing that you don't really, you think it's just like a vector, like you can assign into a tibble and it's slightly more complicated than that. Um, and until you actually go about writing the test, like there's no way that you would ever know this, right? Like, cause you're always, when you're writing a function, you're always on the happy path of how that function, how you're expecting that function to work. And so this is a good example of just like, you write a test and you're like, oh, I really thought that that was gonna be the same, but then it's not exactly the same. And you either need to like change your test to, to figure it out or, um, or change the function to make that name, that name go away. Um, and it's sort of the type of thing where it's like, if you don't do those tests uh, of the function, when that function is then like used downstream by something else, by somebody else or another function that you're writing, um, this could maybe cause like some bug that's actually like affects people or is also just like really, really hard to figure out because you don't, it might be, you know, two months later, you forgot all about compute core and somebody uses it. And then there's this weird name that breaks something. Um, so it's kind of a good, example of just like you test, even if really simple functions, they can often behave the way in, in ways that you didn't envision when you were writing it. And by testing, you kind of are forced to confront actually what your function does. Um, are there any other questions before we take a quick break? Yeah, maybe um, let's take the quick break and then we can come back. There is another good question that we could start off with. All right, everyone stretch your legs, do what you need to do and we will back back in five minutes. We're just now joining here in the middle of our five minute break. Uh, and we are about to pick right back up. Alice, you think it's a good time for me to start up again? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think we can get going again. And um, one thing I was gonna say is maybe it would be good to start with this question, which is yeah. um, in the Google document, which is around, do you have advice for how to choose the data fed into the expected object? So that it's a useful test case. Like here, we're using the eruption data. How do you choose that data? I'll start off with one thing: um, is that I chose a data set from base R, um, so I didn't have to load any additional dependencies into my package. Or you could have also put some inline quick data there that you might have um, tested, or some data that comes with your package. 
Gordon, what else would you say about that? Um, so I think that's the right thing to do. Like first one, it was just like, it's important to just write the tests. Like, so if you just do tests with, and they're not complete, like that's way better. That's a great first step. So however, how, whatever data works for that, that's great. Um, as you kind of go forward, you probably want to figure out, um, like one of the things you want to do with tests is, is like kind of get to the corners of your function. So like testing with extreme data, with missingness. I think somebody had a good question about like missing data, um, you know, negative number, like weird numbers, negative numbers, big numbers, things like that. Um, so you kind of want to, at some point you want to, maybe not like the data itself, but like what kind of things you want to do. You want to think about like exercising all the ways that your function could behave. So those are kind of some th good things to reach for. It's just like if you're, you know, I, I always have tests with like just what if I put NA, like what does this function do if I send an NA to one of these things or these things are missing, you know, um, like those are kind of examples of just trying to do weird stuff. Um, my old colleague, John Keen, um, he would just call this throwing lizards at a function. And this kind of a talent, like people, some other people who you work with, like they're really good at just thinking of just bizarre things that people would do with your functions. Um, and so it's good to put yourself in that mindset a little bit, but the first thing is just to write the tests, and worry about the rest later. Mm -hmm. Awesome, thanks. I think uh, that's, the, that's the last question. I see another question in the chat. It says, do you commonly see test that used against a script instead of a function? Um, I don't. Uh, you can use um, you can use expect equals in scripts and uh, not in testing things. I think for there's a package called asserter, which is probably more appropriate mm -hmm. for scripts. So that's basically like it'll error if something is not the case. So it's like a way of interrupting scripts if they if they fail. I think probably for the most part, if you're writing if you're in this testing world, like functions are the way to go. Um, so trying to get something like packaged in functions and then have the script be more simple, like have less logic in a script and more logic in functions that are tested. Um, that would be my advice there. But being yeah, asserter is great, or breakpoint is another one for um, for our markdown. It does similar kinds of things of so just, just stopping if it's if it's executing and there's a problem. Uh, and that kind of fits more naturally into how people, I think, think when they're writing scripts. Awesome tips. All right. so. Where we left off before the break is I'm still in browser mode. So I'm going to go ahead and click this stop button to get out of my browser mode. And I, let's see here, I have this results up. I've got some things in my environment. Just to start again fresh, I'm going to do Control Shift F10 to restart R. And so we've actually, we fit, we've fixed up Compute Core. We are now expecting. Um, that names error to disappear. And let's see what happens when we run our test. So uh, I thought that would have cleared out when I did restart. That's OK. Um, so we are going to go ahead and uh, run our test again. Let's just go ahead and click this button, run test. Oh no, I have another fail. Okay, so what is the fail this time? It's actually different than the fail we saw before. Um, the fail we saw before is gone about that named attribute and the core thing and all that. But we have a different fail now. So it says the expected uh, value is not equal to 9.901. And I think Someone else had an idea in the chat earlier that it might be due to the tolerance or the rounding. Uh, let's look at the help file and look up uh, expect equal. Let's see if there's anything we can do to allow for that tolerance. Let's see here. Quality expectations. Let's see here. So we have expect equal, we have expect identical. And it says, if you are in edition three, you can put in this tolerance option, I guess, is what it's telling me here. And um, so let's go ahead and add in a tolerance to our argument here. 
and see if it's just a little bit of rounding and storage. So I'm gonna add a tolerance, uh, do control shift S to save this file and I'll go ahead and click run tests again. And this time we got four passes. All right, so we have completed that test and our expect equal is cleared out now. And that little debug at C, that's because there's a, a browser statement still in the compute core. So that's, if you ever see that, sort what, of what printing you out see? it. Uh, so you see that like debug oh. at C, it's because it's, it, it's when there's a browser statement, it, um, it will um, tell you that in the test, but it won't stop like it does in there. Go ahead and, and take this out and I don't need that anymore. Is that, would you physically delete it or comment yeah. it out or? Yeah, thank you for flagging that. That's a good hint that I left it in there. All right, so we'll save that file and we're good to go there now. We, uh, let's see, go back, run our test again, that debug at C, it's gone. Thank you, Gordon. All right. So all we've tested so far are the outputs of our function, but some of you also suggested that we might want to guard the inputs of the function, right? So is the user actually putting in what they intend to? Uh, some of the inputs that you might want to check for are like warning uh, the user if there's missing data values, um, checking to see if those fields are, are numeric, or checking to see if the variables that the user actually um, puts in are in this data set. So that's the last one is what we are going to address now. If you look through the help file for uh, test that, there's, I mean, I haven't looked at it extensively, uh, but there's not really like an expect, a direct way to expect the input. Um, so we're going to get at it a little bit more indirectly here. Uh, and the way we're going to get at it more indirectly is we're going to modify our function over here to check for those inputs and to see if they're actually in the data set. Um, we're going to have our function throw an error or a warning or a message, whatever is appropriate for level of um, action for that. And uh, then we will uh, write an expectation that we are getting that level of action out. Um, because I did try to I did make the decision to write this function using tidy evaluation. It's a little bit more complicated to check that the names of the variables that are input into this function are actually in this data set, but we're gonna go ahead and do this. So uh, we are going to get the character version of our name. So var one underscore chr for character version. We're gonna do our lang as underscore label, as well as our lang colon colon insom var one. So that is going to return the character version of that first variable that's entered. And all of my parentheses are closed. I'm gonna copy and paste this for var two. Sure, you could be sophisticated about it and do some mapping, but that's not what we're gonna to do today. And we are going to alert uh, user if variable is not in data set. Uh, we're going to do that by writing our own warning, error, or message, um, whatever you want to write it. Uh, so if you haven't kind of thought about this topic, what we're talking about here are these signaling conditions. Uh, so signaling conditions fall into errors, warnings, or messages. Uh, and what we want to do, uh, and for the error, you're going to use the stop function from base, uh, or you can use the warning function for a warning or a message function for a message. Uh, so since I want to throw an error, if the user puts in a variable that's not actually in my data set, um, I'm going to use the stop function. So I'm going to check to see if uh, this variable is in our data set. So I'm going to say if I can type all of this out. All right, var one chr uh, is in our percent and percent 
our names of our data. Then, am I missing one parentheses? I don't think so. All right. Um, and then there's two different ways you can throw an error. So the first one is with the base stop function. Uh, so I'm going to write an error with the glue function, glue, glue. Um, that puts out what they actually input back to them. That var one character uh, is not in the data set. I have a typo there. So that should be this, not in the data set. All righty. So if that is not in the names, we should throw an error to our user. And also copy and paste this for var2 or do that you know, with some mapping or iteration if we want it to be a little bit fancier about it, but we're just going to copy and paste today. All right. Hopefully that all looks good. Anyone spot an error before I start running things? Let's see what happens. All right. So I have done uh, control S to uh, save this file. Uh, what else do I want to do? We can write, let's do DevTools load all just to kind of run it in line and see what happens. Uh, so here, let's run compute core. Now this is the one that should be working, right? So we shouldn't have messed up that it's actually working. Um, and then if we write two R's for eruptions, we should get an error. So it's throwing out eruptions is not in the data set. Um, which is a little bit more like a, it's a handy error for the user to see we're actually throwing back uh, what they put into it. Another option you can use instead of stop from base R is you can use um, a UI a set of UI functions um, from the use this package. Uh, so that is going to look like this. So use this colon colon UI underscore stop. Um, if we're going to do that, we can get rid of the glue string. Uh, it will just print that instead. And that is going to behave slightly differently than the stop. So I'm going to do control S, uh, command shift F10 to restart, dev tools load all. just so you can see what it looks like. So this one should work. This one should throw an error. Um, and it just, it gives you a little bit more options when it throws that error that you can like rerun with debug and, and show trace back um, if you wanted to dig in a little bit more um, to what's going on there. Gordon, go ahead. You did, you came off oh, me. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, it's fine. No, but I want to hear your thoughts on it. Um, if you are kind of trying to put up guardrails for your user or throw warnings at them, do you tend to use UI stop or just stop? I just learned about it. So no, uh, I don't think it's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so you have your choices there, um, whatever you want to use. All right. So we're going to do a little bit more iteration, right? So we, now we've got to add the test and we've got to run DevTools check and see what's going on here. Okay. So now that we have, um, we've written in an alert for a user, if they write in a bad variable name, now we've got a test that is going to um, come out. So um, we're not going to test our expected object because our expected object is actually what executes correctly, right? So now we want to need to write something that's going to catch an error. Um, so we are going to expect an error um, if we enter something in incorrectly. So I'm just going to copy and paste this line here. Um, and the inner incorrect thing I'm going to enter is eruptions with two R's. So now control S and we are going to do DevTools test. Let's do DevTools test. Like three different ways you can do this. All right, let's see what happens. All righty, five passing tests. Awesome. 
So, so far we have um, protected our user against, um, our, so, so far we've kind of assessed the outputs of the function that they're working as intended. And we've also written some guardrails, guardrails in for the user to see um, that the user is actually specifying correct things. All right. Are there any questions in the chat before we do a little bit more? Yeah, there's one question in the chat. Um, I can read it out. It's a question on dependencies you're adding to your package. So, you know, what, what do you what do you consider um, when you're editing a package? I have on tidyverse, which is already kind of been covered. Well, that's a great question because I was actually just going to show you something. Um, I have one function in here, and I have four dependencies already. Let's run DevTools check and uh, show you what happens now. Um, and I'm getting a warning now, um, even though all of my tests are passing, um, I am not declaring imports from the glue package or the use this package. So I actually introduced more dependencies when I wrote this bit to protect the user, right? So I, in here in this function, I introduce a dependency on use this. And in this function, I introduce a dependency on glue. So the way I would correct that is to do uh, use this use package. So I'll go ahead and correct that um, over here and let Gordon talk about how he thinks about dependencies in this package. Um, yeah, so it's this is another one of those questions that really is depends on you, the developer, and your users. So like if you're in a, a place where you're confident that you know what packages people have installed or your packages are you know, like you're kind of able to control people's environments a little bit. Um, it's fine to just add a bunch of dependencies. Um, that said, like, I, I do think that, like, there's a lot, like, one of the great things about R is that there's a lot in base R that does most of these things. Like, they might do it slightly less elegantly or slightly a little clunkier. Um, but it's really nice if you have something where it's like a small thing to just try writing it in base R to, um, to just avoid the dependency. Um, where it kind of comes up is, is as these dependencies change, you might need to change your package to fix them. And for some stuff, it's just maybe not worth it. Um, so, you know, an example is like, like Glue is a wonderful package. I use it all the time. Um, sometimes you're like, but like sometimes you're like, well, this is exactly the same as paste, you know, so I'll just use paste and I'll have like more commas and it'll be a little harder to read. Um, but then I, I you know, don't have the dependency. Um, so it kind of depends on like how much work you want to do supporting the dependencies versus like what you're getting out of it. So you're always getting something from including a dependency because usually they're good if you want to use them. Um, but there's a cost, which is just um, maintenance. And, um, you know, sometimes people have a little bit of trouble using packages if there's, if they're like, if they need an old version of glue for some other reason, you're introducing a new version of glue. Um, that's where it can get tricky. I would say that a lot of the packages that are maintained by our studio, um, I um, I tend to include more liberally because they're pretty consistent with each other. Um, but sometimes with other things, I, and I see this a lot with newer developers doing pull requests where it's like, they might include something that's, you know, it's, it's really, it's like nice, but it's not really necessary. And then that's the kind of time when you maybe want to sort of say, can we try to maybe, you know, pull a function from that package into our package so that we don't have to include the whole dependency or right use the base R equivalent or something like that. Yeah. Uh, but package development is where you really, really appreciate base R, I would say, because um, it, it is you, you realize that there's like it's a lot, a lot of power in the language itself that you can can use just it's the less consistent uh, arguments and stuff. I think that's it for questions. I don't see anything else. Okay. So this is actually all I wanted to do for the compute core function. Um, we tested outputs, we tested inputs, and now our uh, compute core function and package itself is back in a great state with zero errors, zero warnings, and zero notes. 
And so for the remainder of the time, we have a little bit of a challenge function to work on and think through. So I will pull it up real quick. It's on the repo that goes with this workshop. And down here in the readme, um, this is the challenge function. So I don't know how much uh, talking versus letting you all grappling with it you wanna do. Um, so here we have an awesome R ladies function. Um, it shows you a couple of example executions and you're, our task for the remainder of the time that we have is how can we break this function up to make it easier to test? Uh, what type of object should the function output and what type of fun object does this function expect? And again, about putting up guardrails for that user so they don't send the wrong thing to this object. Would you all like a few minutes to think about this quietly or would you like me to start typing away? You can put your opinions in the chat. If it's n equals one, it will win. Yeah, it's getting late. No one wants to think. Everyone just wants me to think. All right, Alice, you win. <laughs> Take it away. Okay, I'm eating. We do it. Yep, got it. Okay, I'm just gonna keep typing. Okay, here we go. Um, all right, so the first thing that we are going to do uh, is we are going to add a new function, a new script. So we're going to do that with use this, use r. Uh, and we are going to put in the awesome r ladies function. All right. At uh, the same time, I am going to copy and paste this function from the readme into here. Um, you'll notice here that I, we are using the glue function and then I'm converting it back out to a character object. The glue function is awesome for like kind of, kind of creating these readable strings, but it also kind of creates this glue object, which doesn't always like play well downstream with other things and with testing and all that. Um, so that's why I'm doing that. Uh, so we can see how this function is going to execute. Um, I'm going to do control S on this. I'm going to do dev tools load all. Um, and now we should be able to check out our awesome R ladies. So what happens if we have one awesome R lady? There is one awesome R lady. Uh, what if we put in two? Oh, there are two awesome R ladies. And what if we put in one colon two? Now uh, we are going to do some iteration over that vector and we see there is one awesome R lady, there are two awesome R, R ladies, and now uh, we are going to be doing a lot of iteration over that vector. Should we test awesome R ladies one to infinity? Um, not live, no. <laughs> We'll not test that live, but you are welcome to do that on your own time. Thanks for the suggestion, Alex. <laughs> All right. Um, so our first task at hand is, like, let's talk about what about this function can be broken up, right? Like what are the different distinct components of this function? How could we break this up into something that is simpler, that might be easier to test? Are there any ideas about that. So I think at the heart of it, a lot of um, testing is related to refactoring your code, to making your code boil down to its simplest elements that can be individually tested that get rolled up into bigger things. Yeah, so I think I see some things in the chat about decimals and negative numbers, and those are certainly things we want to guard the user against, right? Um, so what's going to happen if we put in a negative one? Uh, we're going to get some like really unfriendly error message out. Um, so that's not good. Maybe we want to um, protect the guard, uh, protect the user with some guardrails against that kind of misspecification. So can we split the one and more than one parts up? Yeah, that's exactly what we were thinking, Alice. So, um, oh, actually maybe, 
maybe yes, maybe no, right? So there is this um, iteration component and then there's these two components. I don't know which one you were thinking like this one and this more than one, um, but kind of more along the lines of what we were thinking is like, there is this inner component that actually writes the message, right? That's one thing that's going on in the middle. And then there is this outer component with a supply that's doing the iteration to repeat that process over and over again. And those are those are two different things that we can actually break up. Um, and breaking it up into those two different things might make it easier to test downstream, right? So uh, what we're writing the message and then we're iterating on that as well. Um, so let's see here. How are we going to break this up into two functions? Well, the first one is like, can, can we write a single message, right? A single message can be written like this. So I'm going to make my write our ladies function. It's a function of some value x. And um, I'm going to take this middle part straight out of it, right? So basically this guy, right, our ladies. Um, and now we're not doing any iteration on it. Um, if you want to use different words to describe this, Gordon, you are welcome to jump in. Um, we are going to do control S to save this. We're going to do dev tools, load all. And uh, now we are going to write our ladies uh, on the number one. Uh, no our ladies, it's just right ladies. Yeah, let's, let's fix that. Thank you. All righty. Uh, so dev tools load all right. Our ladies. All right. There's one awesome our lady. We can do it for two. Um, there are two awesome our ladies. And what happens when we try to put in multiple inputs? That's something we could like maybe work on. It's like outputting some stuff, it's like not really making sense. It's like not behaving exactly expected and it's not supposed to do the iteration in there and mm, not great. Okay, but we can kind of wrap that in another function to take care of um, that iterative part. So we're gonna do another function called compose our ladies. And then this is where we're going to do our iteration. So I'm going to do it instead of using S supply, um, I'm going to use the per package, introducing another dependency. And if we didn't want to, we could keep it with S supply. Um, and we're going to write the R ladies message as many times as we want to. Um, and so now I've done Control S. Uh, I can do Control Shift L to load all. And let's see here, if we compose our ladies, like, and kind of what I'm doing now, right, is I'm kind of just testing things in the console um, informally, ad hoc to see what happens. Um, of course, we want to formalize that and seeing like kind of what, um, yeah, seeing kind of what output we're getting. So we, we've broken that function up into two parts, right? One part that, that writes, uh, one part that writes the message and another part that is going to iterate over that message as many times as we need to with compose our ladies. Alrighty, so we've broken up our function and before we kind of talk about how we are going to test it now, um, are there any questions about this function? And can anyone hear my daughter crying in the background? I think she said a bit cool. I don't see any questions. So I think I think we're good to keep going. Okay. All right. Okay. So now we have uh, a couple of functions and we can create another test for these functions. So uh, we're gonna write, write use this, use test. And uh, we're going to call this the awesome our ladies test file. Uh, and then let's put in, let's see here. I'm going to call this 
assess. Uh, assess, awesome, our ladies. Um, you can, I believe, uh, keep this description with spaces in it as well. You don't have to have um, underscores or anything. So it's just your description file. Uh, first of all, we are going to uh, evaluate the output produced. So let's do another expected here. Uh, we're going to write our ladies. And if we do this one time, we know exactly what it should look like. Um, so we are going to say that we should expect the type of output and expect it the character. I'm also going to call this expected one. So I'm going to do another one. Um, let's go ahead and run this test. Alrighty. So remember, run test is going to only run the test on this individual file. There's only one test here, so it didn't touch my compute core tests. Um, and that one test has passed. Um, I'm going to copy this. Might start going a little faster here because I know it's starting to get a little late and a little short on time. Um, we're going to create another one for what happens if we put in an expected two. Um, and we should actually know uh, the message that we should get out exactly, right? So we should expect equal expected underscore one. And it should write out this message exactly. There is one awesome, our lady. And if we, I'm, now I'm just gonna be lazy and copy and paste from my notes. Uh, if we have uh, expect two, we should see exactly there are two awesome R ladies. So control S to save, let's run these tests. So we're, uh, and we've got three passing tests. That's great. So we've done the expectations on the individual writing single messages to make sure that those are working correctly. And uh, now let's see what happens if we want to write out multiple message at one time. So um, let's see here. We are going to expect multiple. Let's see here. What do you think is something we can test on this one if we put in two entries? Well, if I am doing it two times, how many things out should I expect? Um, so if I am writing, let's see, I might need to load all, let's see here. Nope. Uh, so if I um, in doing compose our ladies one colon two, how many, uh, what, I don't know how to say it without giving it away. What is the length of that output? <laughs> Two, right? So we can expect the length, right? Uh, so let's expect the length of that outfit. Uh, we expected multiple object. That should be control S to save. Yeah, I know. Um, and we're going to run our tests. Oh, man, and I have a fail. Hold on. Expected multiple not found. Uh, yeah, because I called it expect multiple. That's why found debugging my tests. Here we go. 
Um, and now I have four passing tests. Um, another thing that uh, we want to protect our user against is um, different types of output that they might put in. So we can go back and again, iterate and modify our function to protect against those different forms of output, right? So in this particular function, um, what are the criteria that we are, like what are the inputs we're expecting? What should we um, uh, make sure that the user does? Must be numeric, yeah. Integers, yeah, it might be weird if there's like a half our lady, uh, we could check that too. Uh, so yeah, numeric um, and something greater than zero, that's a great place to start. And I think you can go as deep with it as you wanna go. Um, so to do that again, we're gonna go back to our function, back to our awesome our ladies function. Um, I'm gonna add this here in our right our ladies. So I'm gonna put in some guardrails here. So, oh yeah, we could see if it's missing or blank or anything. Uh, so the guardrails that I'm going to put up here, it's a little bit, so we're going to check to see if it's numeric and if it's greater than or equal to one, if the input is numeric or greater than or equal to one. And if that is not true, let's see here, there are all of my parentheses in line. Um, if that is not tr true, um, if it's not numeric and if it's not greater than or equal to one, uh, then we should throw up an error. So we're going to do, I'll use this again. So use. Uh, UI stop. Input must be numeric and greater than or equal to one. Control S, Control Shift L for dev tools load all. Let's write our ladies and see what's happening here in the console. That's great. And what happens if I put in zero, getting my message out exactly as expected. And now I can go in and formalize that into my test over here. So we'll go back over to my test. And again, we are going to expect an error. And we should expect an error now for anything uh, that's not numeric and anything that's not greater than or equal to one. Uh, so let's catch those errors. And we are going to expect an error. Uh, what would you expect an error for? What should I put in here? Compose our ladies. What do you want to try? Ooh, stop if not. Let's talk about that when I finish this thought. Um, let's see here. I, sh I should expect an error if I put in A, and thank you for the suggestion, Peter. I should expect an error if I put in negative one, and I should expect an error if I choose to write out one, yes, instead of putting in the numeric version of one. Uh, so let's see here. Um, let's do control S, and let's run these tests, and all of these should result in errors. All right, we've got seven passing tests. That's great. Gordon, you had a comment in there. Another shorthand is stop if not. Yeah, so stop if not, it just comes up a lot where you're doing sort of similar things to it's just the same conditional you wrote there, which is like, uh, I'm asserting that I want you, I want to error if you gave me something that's wrong, like this is a numeric or this isn't a character, or this is the wrong length or something like that. Um, so there's a stop if not as a base function that just is basically gives you an error that says like, you know, X is not numeric, like, and, and so it's it's a kind of handy little, um, uh, yeah, base stop if not. Um, so just sort of whatever you put in, like, so you could do stop if not is numeric X, and then it would just error if there wasn't, an, if there were, if it was an X. Um, it's not as, this. so your, your, your error is better because it's more expressive, uh, but it's also harder to write. So if you, so stop if not, it's a really good, like, just like, I just want to make sure you don't try to send me like a vector of length two or something that's not numeric and then uh, stop if not is a great um, great way of going for that. Let's just see how it looks different, right? So we're not going to get out our handy message, but we're going to say like is dot numeric x or not. I think that's right. Yeah. But like a not uh, it's, it, right? Uh, no, 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 not. So it's no, stop no, not. if that is not true. Not. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Let's so let's see what happens here. Uh, so we're gonna do uh, let's clear that screen. Dev tools load all. And let's write our ladies. Let's confirm first that one works. And what happens when we put in A? Um, we stopped our function. Yeah. So you got this like boilerplate error message, but you didn't have to do very much typing to do it. So yeah. <laughs> awesome tip. Thank you. So that is it for our prepared content today. We are happy to take any further questions or discussion that you have. Oh, awesome. Um, I, I maybe we'll, let's do like one more question, but then I think we should probably wrap up. I do see one question that was put in here was, does the same test that framework work for Shiny apps? Yeah, so with Shiny, it's it's a little tricky. So there's, um, so what I'd recommend with Shiny is, um, this is like break as much of your logic in your function, in your Shiny app into functions that live outside of your Shiny app. So like a, a, a function that you're uh, like a, a source helpers function or something that you're sourcing. And then you can test those functions just like you test um, any other function with, with these exact formats. Um, if you're doing tests that are um, involve reactivity in Shiny apps, uh, you need to use a framework called Shiny Test, um, which is, is a little bit more complicated. It's basically around um, like interacting with app and it'll sort of store state and run that through a through a browser. So you can test Shiny apps um, in a, a slightly different way for the reactivity. Um, I think for the most part, um, using this framework for testing and taking as much of the like the actual lo logic that doesn't involve the reactive parts of your application out and testing them. So like test that you have a, a maybe you have a function that generates just a, a plot and then you have that you call that in a reactive context and like pass in arguments to that plot. Um, that's the way to that I recommend doing that for for this, and it's, it's really similar to what um, what Shannon just demonstrated, which is like when you start testing, you often will break your functions apart and simplify them because it makes them easier to test, and that's uh, that's a really valuable thing to do, I think, in Shiny, especially because a lot of times Shiny apps get really bloated because they you just keep throwing more and more logic into the you know generate reactive whatever, and then it becomes really really difficult to comprehend. But when you start trying to like test parts of that, you're like, oh, I could test easily if I just make this inner bit a function uh, and then you do that and then your app gets cleaner and simpler and so there's kind of this like virtuous cycle of testing improving your code so that your tests are easier to write and then you know like and then over time you get into the habit of just like writing your functions like that um, but uh, if you don't ever test it's it's hard to do that because you're just like oh it works you know <laughs> let me ship it but uh, yeah there's a whole um, a bunch of content on the shiny website about how to test shiny apps um, Awesome. And I think this is probably a good place to wrap. Um, if you if you all want to revisit the, the Q&A doc, of course, and add any answers and things like that, it'll be available as well after the meetup as a reference. But I, I think now would be a good time to just thank Shannon and Gordon again, I guess, a virtual round of applause. <laughs> it's hard to do over Zoom, but thank you again for this wonderful uh, workshop. And the materials are great. And we will be, as a reminder to everybody, posting the uh, re or a replay on YouTube for everybody. And Shannon will also be preparing a blog post. So if everyone wants to uh, you know, follow us on Twitter, uh, look, look forward to our upcoming events, that would be great. And with that, uh, thank you again, Shannon and Gordon. And everyone, have a great night. <laughs>